So the way most people get into Bitcoin in these countries is by buying that Bitcoin on the Friday, stress to their minds. Mm -hmm. And then they couldn't figure out how to sell it come Saturday. And they couldn't figure out how to sell it on Sunday. But on Monday, they had a friend that helped them set up an account that, I don't know, some random exchange, Binance, okay? But then come Monday, they had paid $200 for the Bitcoin on Friday. And when they're, going, they're about to sell it on, on Monday at Binance, they see that that thing is now $240. And their minds blow up. Because in Venezuela, no one had seen an asset appreciate in dollar terms. Wow. That is just mind-bending for most people. Hello and welcome to Bitcoin with Jake. Listen in to hear from Bitcoiners dispersed all across the globe whose personal journeys I leverage to gain conviction in an ongoing due diligence process. I need to take a moment to mention our sponsors. Orange Pill App is for those of us that want to meet Bitcoiners. Dubbed Bitcoin Social Layer, it helps you connect in an ultra-local fashion whilst also curating suitable events nearby. Check out episode 48 to hear the journey of Matteo, the founder of Orange Pill App, in case you need any more excuses to sign up. Hardblock is an Australian Bitcoin exchange. They have been serving the community from as far back as 2014, never got sucked into the dubious world of altcoins, and continue to be one of the industry leaders down under. Check out episode 17 to hear from Daniel Wilczynski, the founder of Hardblock, for a more in-depth background. Now, let's get on with today's show. Today, I'm speaking with Mauricio de Bartolomeo. Hey, Mauricio, how are you? I'm doing great, Jake. It's nice to finally speak with you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Bit of preamble, I guess, to mention to the guests. So I, I sent out a tweet relatively recently asking about why isn't there a good product out there for Bitcoiners to take debt against their Bitcoin and buy real estate. If you really get down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, you want to own Bitcoin, but you also do need a family home. And, uh, and that's a great discussion that we will get to towards the end of this, I'm sure. But to start things, I always begin in the same way, Mauricio. Can you wind the clock back and tell us where were you? What were you doing when Bitcoin became part of your life? It's a great question. So typically when I tell the story, I start a little before Bitcoin, just because I'm from Venezuela. And so I saw hyperinflation before I saw Bitcoin. Yeah. I saw my currency completely fail. I didn't find Bitcoin in my family. My brother found it, then told my dad about it. My dad became a Bitcoiner and then he told me about it. <laughs> Where I was in life at the time. So I'm originally, like I said, from Venezuela. My family, I guess, like many others, spent some time in the U.S. right after Chavez got elected. Because in 1998, 1999, when Hugo Chavez got elected in Venezuela, a lot of families thought that he would be a one-term affair and uh, that they would just wait out his term, uh, living abroad, having mm -hmm. a vacation. And our family tried to do that, tried to escape the country and kind of test our luck in, in Florida. But that, uh, that wasn't sustainable because we were earning, you know, depreciating Bolivares in my dad's business and spending dollars that got increasingly more expensive. Wow. And private businesses got absolutely hammered under Chavez. And my dad was a private businessman. So that was not sustainable. We had to go back to Venezuela. So when I got a taste of North America, I always wanted to go back to stay here to finish my studies. So I always kind of wanted to come back to North America after moving back to Venezuela. And I did that uh, after grade 11, I came to Canada. So to, to kind of, you know, short circuit the story a little bit, unless you want to dive into that for a bit. I first heard about Bitcoin. It was summer 2015. I was in Canada working. And my dad sent me the white paper and said that this was my youngest brother's most recent pitch. And by that, I mean, we come from an entrepreneurial family, three brothers, and my dad is a serial entrepreneur. So every one of us, when we graduated, my dad wrote us a little angel check to test our venture chops. Cool. And I had mine, my middle brother had mine. It was now my youngest brother's turn. But in this case, the country was a shambles. So my dad didn't want to green light anything that had to do with the country. He wow. kept trying to push my brother to leave, but my brother didn't want to leave. And uh, he kept proposing business ideas for Venezuela. And towards the end, it was getting to a sort of a standoff because my brother wanted to stay. My dad didn't want to green light anything that involved staying. And my brother basically sends this last pitch as an ultimatum and says, I'm doing this whether you support me or not. And if you don't, I'm leaving the house. And wow. basically, my dad sees that and he's like, oh, wow, he's serious. So he sends me the white paper, says, what do you think? And I take a look at it. What I understood at the time was that the miners were the sort of bodyguards of the network. 
And the way they did that was taking a bunch of electricity to process and hash as much as they could to organize the transactions and sort of propose a nonce that made sense. Mm -hmm. And basically, it was inputs I saw as electricity plus hardware plus internet equals Bitcoin. Electricity was free in Venezuela by many accounts. It was heavily, heavily subsidized at mm -hmm. the time. So was the internet. And so it really was basically, you were at a disproportional advantage mining in Venezuela because you were paying for power where everyone else was paying for power. You were paying mm. absolutely zero for power. So that, to me, it was, you know, local subsidized inputs, globally sellable output. <laughs> in Venezuela at the time, there was a strict capital control regime, meaning that you could not buy or sell dollars. And that meant that the US dollars were just hyperinflating away. And so anything that you could produce in Venezuela that could be sold for dollars that could then be traded at the real market rate, which was the black market rate or the official market rate, was an absolute money printer. So that is eventually what mining became in Venezuela. It, it, it became just incredibly profitable. <laughs> and the early miners made fortunes. Wow. So um, I was in Canada when I first found out about Bitcoin. I gave my opinion in that summer. and. My brother bought the machines and I kind of forgot about it. And when I went back for Christmas of that year, my brother had like three times the machines. <laughs> and that's when we had to have a pretty serious conversation because I went back. My first in intuition was my dad just lent him more money. There's no way this business could have grown this way it's not mm -hmm. so fast. And so I went to my dad and my dad said, no, he paid me back. That's his money. That's those are his computers. And I went to my brother and I was like, what are you really doing? And he tells me I'm mining Bitcoin. And he wow. basically says, let me show you. And back then, you could not convert dollars easily. It, it was impossible. And it was very hard to turn anything into bolivares at a fair rate. And he was able to sell Bitcoin at the official, at the best possible rate the market could take. And half the Bitcoin sold and the bolivares transferred to my account within minutes. And that's the precise moment when everything got blurry and I went down the rabbit hole. Mauricio, no, that's absolutely brilliant. There's so many things for me to draw on there. Wow. So I asked that same question at the beginning of these episodes, and I'm now, you know, 80 or so episodes in, and I get different answers every single time. I've been lucky to have the Sultan Bitcoin on. And so he's taught me a bit about the background of Venezuela, and I hadn't ever met or spoken to someone from your country before. So the macro situation there is unbelievable. For people that, like myself, grew up in the UK, now based in Australia, had a stint in Singapore, you're in Canada. The average person doesn't understand what it actually feels like to have your money just disintegrate around you. And then the incentive scheme that, that comes about from that, trying to get your hands on whatever's the best form of money you can find. Any argument that like, our oh, Bitcoin's useless. And then I meet someone like yourself and speak to you. And it's just a brilliant, brilliant example as to why that particular argument is utterly ridiculous. What I'd love to draw on, Mauricio, and something that people won't necessarily understand. So the, the, the incoming president, Chavez, in 1998. So just talk us through exactly what that was like and why were families like yours as business owners, teach us what business your father was running at the time, why were you forced to, to leave the country and why did you think it was just a holiday and how's that actually played out? Because that's really fascinating. Oh, man, so much to say there. So when Chavez comes into power, many people don't really know who Chavez is. And that's largely because groups like the New York Times and economists like Joseph Stiglitz were championing and celebrating him when he got elected, even though they were, they were basically applauding a criminal, really. But so about Chavez, let's start there. So Chavez is a member of the Venezuelan military. Before he became president, he was part of the a skydiving division of the Venezuelan Armed Forces. And he was unique in that in 1989 or 1990, he attempted to lead the first coup d'etat against the Venezuelan president. So he, and he failed. That first coup failed. Then I, I believe somehow he, um, he did a second coup. I don't know if he did the second coup from jail or he was actually pardoned and then did the second coup. But in 92, he tries this again. And he tries to overthrow the presidents by force again in 1992 and fails for the second time. And he goes to jail the second time. So even within jail, he kept moving his sort of political chips and pressure kept building in Venezuela socially because 
what happens in a country like Venezuela is when you're an oil producer, your country is at the whims of oil revenue. And if you are a great government in a crappy cycle of the oil market, the economy is going to do nothing because you depend so largely on oil. But if you are a horrible president, but you happen to strike an oil rally, then all of a sudden everything looks great despite your absolute horrible administration, right? So leading up to Chavez, we had a slump in oil prices. <laughs> And that created a massive discontent in Venezuela, big crisis, big banking crisis, uh, you know, all the associated things that come with an economic recession or, or, or having your national income cut by like, you know, a third of, of what it was, or just dropping the national revenue horribly. And that has a huge impact on the economy. So Venezuela dances to the beat of oil markets. Mm -hmm. It always has. And there's a big disconnect between the effectiveness of an administration and what it can accomplish economically because of the same, because of the reasons, because of their different dynamics, right? But leading up to Chavez's election, we have a guy that's obviously a military guy. He's not a trained politician. He's a, clearly a very discontent individual <laughs> that has a, a chip against the status quo. But then his influence and power keeps growing even within jail because Venezuela is clamoring a change and he's the guy that's had the sort of guts to try this twice you know mm -hmm. almost like not through the democratic means and people are getting very antsy for change they don't want to wait for a new election they want change now right and so mm -hmm. this concept of hey you know we need a change people basically was like we need a change there was a lot of tension in the environment and this this chavez when a 1999 election or 1990 yeah it was 1999 election was approaching he basically you know and, and not so many words says hey, if you don't do anything, I'm going to try this thing again. And the president that's about to leave, Rafael Caldera, decides to pardon Hugo Chavez so that Chavez doesn't do this coup by force, but he tries to run politically, <laughs> right? So he says, I'm going to pardon you. Let's go, you know, tit for tat at the polls kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, big mistake. <laughs> he pardons Chavez. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the first thing Chavez does when he gets pardoned is he takes a flight to Cuba. And he starts getting training from the, the Cuban Secret Service, the G2 El Helos. A lot of people don't know that that exists, but they exist and they're really, really good uh, at what they do. And so he starts getting indoctrinated, given the playbook from, you know, the, the communist mm. axis, right? Mm. Mm. Comes back to Venezuela with this moderate, you know, almost like Obama-ish campaign, like, oh, we should all come together. I'm not going to be a communist. I'm going to be a social democrat. And capitalism is going to be able to coexist and we're going to get more rights to the people. And he was a great salesman. You know, his pitch was very seductive, <laughs> if you would. And so many people fell for it. Others that didn't, others that knew about who he was. This guy has no political training. He's a military guy, two failed coups, you know, big influence from Cuba, all the check marks of what you shouldn't want <laughs> as a president, right? Mm -hmm. And immediately, many people that see this are like, I'll be caught dead if, you know, if I let this guy take my assets, I'm going to hedge this out. And a lot of people had a lot of faith in the democratic institutions that Venezuela had and that this guy would be gone because of all the bad policies that he was going to try to enact, right? Many people mm -hmm. didn't anticipate for him to be the wave that he became. So Chavez wins the election in 1999 and he comes into power. And the second he gets elected, oil markets get spooked because oil markets are very savvy <laughs> and they see what just happened. There's this crazy person that has now gotten elected to one of the main oil markets in the planet. Mm -hmm. There's no way this ends well. <laughs> so oil starts rallying <laughs> and because anticipated production challenges from countries like Venezuela, right? And rightfully so. Oil, but the thing is, oil starts rallying because people are anticipating the incompetence of the Venezuelan government. Mm -hmm. But because the production doesn't fall off a cliff tomorrow, right? Like the, the machines can keep producing it. That, that's been a gradual deterioration until today. So to give you an example, I have to check the stat today. Okay, so when Chavez took office, Venezuela was producing 3.5 million barrels of oil per day. The last report states that Venezuela, as of February of 2023, was producing 700,000 wow. barrels of oil per day. Just to give you a sense of the collapse uh, but that took time. For, for a while, they were still at 3.5 million barrels per day at prices that were just shooting higher and higher. So the Chavez government just had money just coming in and in and in and in. At the same time, they started doing very horrible things to private companies. So for example, 
they um, eliminated very quickly on after Chavez's presidency, he started eliminating the licenses for radio stations and TV stations that didn't align with mm. his editorial line. Anything that opposed him didn't get a license renewed. And systematically, he closed, I think it was like 1,500 radio stations, two or three of the big TV stations. And he started controlling the media. Then he started basically trying to, inflation kicks in. And he started arbitrarily trying to regulate the prices of chicken and beef. And basically, he starts expropriating producers left, right, and center. He's basically saying, guys, you need to price the chicken at $5. And the producers were saying, but Chavez, chicken cost us $7 to produce. Like We, we could have possibly sell it at 5 And he says, no, we can sell it at 5 And let us buy your company. And basically, they, he, he bought this. He did this a few times. Obviously, the old companies failed. And... Mm -hmm. To replace the failed internal production, he started using all of his oil revenue to import the best chicken, the best meat, and basically stock up Venezuelan shelves with Argentinian beef, you know, Brazilian beans, all completely subsidized at completely subsidized prices. Wow. So there was a point in time in Venezuela where you could get, I think it was like three or four pound beef pieces of AAA Angus beef brought from Texas, they would cost you the equivalent of $2. So everybody was having the beautiful grills, you know, wow. that you could bring in like imported scotch, the, the Buchanan's, which is a very popular whiskey in Venezuela. It's mm -hmm. typically like $45 a bottle. You could buy that for like the equivalent of 10. Wow. And so because everything was subsidized to maintain this charade that the economy was doing okay. Mm. Eventually the oil revenue went away. And the production was gone. And we ended up in the misery that we have today because you don't have the money to import or the capacity to produce internally. Mm -hmm. And what that leads to is the largest migration crisis in the history of continental Americas, well, which is what has happened in Venezuela. So I am one of the 6 million people that have left the country since these guys have been in power. And to give you a sense, it's a country with the latest reported numbers of 27 million inhabitants. Yeah. So we're talking about 20% of a population of a country ejecting over the course of 20 years. That's an extraordinary story. And sorry, just briefly, so what was the family business that your father was running? Yes. So at the time, my dad had a shoe factory. So my dad would okay. basically fabricate shoes, make shoes, and he had a series of stores across the country where he would distribute his own shoes. So it was mostly okay. women's shoes. What was the main government intervention that affected his business? So this, among the main things, uh, one was there was a heavy push for unionization and worker rights. It was almost instantly after Chavez took office, workers, it was almost like a harmonious relationship until Chavez took office, because when he took office, the employees felt so empowered that they felt that, you know, the owners were all replaceable, right? Like if they, if they all got together... They could just pitch to the government to like, overthrow these guys. And, and basically, these guys felt that they could take these guys for court for anything, right? And they would win. And in fact, that's the case. I believe, I can't remember the last stats, but from when I left the country about seven years ago, in the entire presidency of Chavez and Maduro, the labor law, like the labor court the, where you take a labor disputes, had not filed once in favor of a corporation in like 14 years. <laughs> And so that just gives you an idea that like everything that these people demanded, you basically had to agree to. And then over time, what became even more difficult was that Chavez was throwing out all these incentives into the economy, like free food, free housing, free medicine, free this. And people stopped wanting to work to mm -hmm. a great extent. And so there were just a myriad of issues. The main ones were labor related. Like, for example, one of the laws that was introduced really early on was that it made it very difficult to fire a worker for non-performance. It made it almost impossible to fire. And so nobody wanted to hire anymore because yeah. you couldn't really fire people. And then if you tried to do like some type of contract work with somebody, they would take you to court. And they would be like, no, this guy has to pay me all the benefits. And I want that law that says I can't get fired. Like, book me through there. And so as a company, it became very, very difficult to do business, especially as you were competing against Chinese imports <laughs> that mm -hmm. were just increasingly cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so it just made it very, very hard to do that. And also because of the capital controls that were imposed very early on, it basically killed your option to export because you could not sell your goods for dollars and get the dollars back at a fair rate. You, you would basically get the dollars back at the government set rate. 
which was always artificially below the market. And I know I'm throwing a lot of data on on here because no, no, do it. No, hit us with it. It's great. So when a government instills a capital control, Mm -hmm. it's typically to maintain good optics on its own development metrics. So for example, if I am Venezuela and I say that the exchange rate is two bolivars per dollar and the minimum wage is a thousand bolivars per month, at $2 per bolivar, your minimum wage is $500 per month. One of the best minimum wages in Latin America, right? Because your official exchange rate says this. But if you go out to the street and you try to buy a dollar, the bank won't sell it to you at two bolivares. Nobody will sell it to you for two bolivares. The only person that will will sell it to you for 10 bolivares per dollar. Wow. And so if you do that number, then your official wage that you report to the United Nations is not $500 a month. It's actually 100. Hmm. And so you're actually the worst salary in the... But there's a... Another complication that comes from setting an artificial exchange rate, which is if I'm an exporter and I sell my shoes, I get $10 for them. When I bring those dollars back, I have to sell them to you, the government. And you're only going to give me 20 bolivares for those $10. And I know those $10 are worth 100 bolivares mm-hmm. because it's, it's, it's 10 to 1, not 2 to 1. So I am not enticed to produce an export from your country. So I will stop exporting. And that is another hit to an economy. Capital controls just completely throw your incentives out of whack. It's an absolutely fascinating story. Thank you for explaining all of this. It must have been an incredibly difficult time for your family. The amount of effort, love, energy that goes into running a business is you know, off the charts, basically. And especially if it's a successful one, to see it come under such pressure, that must have been incredibly testing for you guys as a family. And you're obviously now based in Canada. I wonder how many of the 6 million Venezuelans that don't live in Venezuela any longer would actually prefer to live in Venezuela if they could. It just you know, isn't possible. All of us. Really? Wow. Um, That's amazing, isn't it? Leaving a country is like mourning a relative. It's, mm-hmm. it's not a simple decision. You've done it. You know, you've, yep. you've moved. And now, I will say, Moving willingly is different. Is very yes, I was say, different. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an economic migrant in that sense. No, I did it by choice because I was actually looking for economic opportunity elsewhere. That's what took me out of the UK and I wanted to travel and ended up meeting an Australian and now I'm based in Australia. And those have been very different decisions to, to what you've just so mentioned. It would be the equivalent of me telling you, Jake, a new government has just come into Australia. As of tomorrow, all of your assets cannot be sold. Your Australian dollars are now worth a tenth of what they were yesterday, and they cannot be traded for dollars. And the day after tomorrow, they'll probably be worth a tenth of what they are today. Fuck, and crazy. guess what, Jake? Every other country now is asking for visas for Australians to go live and work there mm. because of this change. So you cannot get on a plane and do what you were thinking of doing without going and applying for a visa. And guess what, Jake? There's a list of 5 million other people that want to do the same thing. And so your visa appointment's going to be about a year from now. Wow. And so Mauricio, we've, we've painted a, an excellent picture here of what life was like growing up in Venezuela. And your brothers figured out how to Bitcoin mine with subsidized energy, which seems like just the most perfect fuck you to the government that's kind of screwing things over. But Bitcoin is this new type of money. It's independent of government. And it's something that is almost perfectly suited to what you've just described so for those out there that don't necessarily understand that overlay like bitcoin comes along what do you think i mean how did you look at it did you understand it straight away and go oh fuck it bring it on or did it take a while to learn and what are some of the most important things to you that that you value it for so i think this is an important moment to make a bit of a distinction and and that is the people that i speak to in canada and most of my north american friends have come into bitcoin because intellectual allure Okay, which is intellectual discovery. It's not out of necessity. It's out of reading books and, you know, personal life experiences here and there. But it's more of an intellectual discovery process than a necessity process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Latin America, and this is something that I'll emphasize on this and any other Bitcoin podcast. The primary consideration that anyone has in Latin America is that it works. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily care how it works or why it works. They care that it works. So let me tell you a bit about how most Venezuelans got into Bitcoin. 
hyperinflation is happening. Inflation is running at 2 million percent. So just to give people an idea, this is the equivalent of you asking for a quote at a store and that person not being able to wanting to give you a quote because they cannot price a good if you're not there ready to pay because the price is changing so rapidly. Wow, so that's crazy. It's insanity. So you get paid. You get paid on a Friday. Banks are closed, by the way, Saturday and Sunday. Okay, So you get paid on a Friday. And you know that it's going to be very hard for you to move that money Saturday and Sunday. And you know that by Monday, that might be worth half of what it's worth. So you literally get paid at three and you have two hours left on Friday to figure out what to do with those bolivares before they're worth half. So you just clocked out of your work. You have two hours to go make sure that all you did for the previous 15 days doesn't go to waste. Wow. <laughs> and you get on the phone immediately. Because you know the government's not going to sell you dollars. You can't just roll up to your bank and be like, hey, guys, I want to convert this into dollars. Okay? So you start the hunt. The hunt for dollars. And you start calling people up and saying, hey, do you got dollars? I need to sell, you know, 5,000 bolivares. What can you give me? And the guy, and then you'll start saying, sorry, no inventory. Sorry, no inventory. Nobody that has dollars in this environment wants to sell them. Dollars are in very short supply now. Everybody wants them. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, not, can't help you. Sorry, can't help you. Oh, I can help you. I can definitely transfer it. I have a client of mine has the dollars at Bank of America and you have the Bolivares at Banesco. So you must have another account at Bank of America to get the dollar leg and you must have a Banesco account to do the Bolivar leg. If you don't, I'm sorry, this client's not for you. So basically no one can transact in these conditions, yeah, right? Yeah, wow. Especially the average person. So the next thing goes... Damn, what can I do? I've called six people. Nobody has dollars. And then the guy on the other line is going to go, well, I got this thing called Bitcoin that you can sell for dollars. You want to give that a shot? And you're like, I guess so. How do I get it? And they're like, go online, get a wallet. You send it to me and then you can create an account in this thing called Bitser or Coinbase. And then you can figure out how to sell it for dollars. But wow. at least you won't have Bolivares, right? So at 2 million percent inflation, the last thing that works through your mind is how volatile is Bitcoin? <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's literally the last question that you get asked. Okay. The next question is, how do I sell it for dollars? Right. Because ultimately, that's what a lot, most people want. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't have the time to understand Bitcoin. I'm just going to make that very clear. Yeah. They need yeah. help. So the way most people get into Bitcoin in these countries is by buying that Bitcoin on the Friday, stressed to their minds. Mm -hmm. And then they couldn't figure out how to sell it come Saturday. And they couldn't figure out how to sell it on Sunday. But on Monday, they had a friend that helped them set up an account that, I don't know, some random exchange, Binance, okay? But then come Monday, they had paid $200 for the Bitcoin on Friday. And when they go, we're about to sell it on, on Monday at Binance, they see that that thing is now $240. And their minds blow up. Because in Venezuela, no one had seen an asset appreciate in dollar terms. Wow. That is just mind-bending for most people. The fact okay. that not only can what you bought preserve its dollar value, but grow its dollar value. Mm -hmm. Unheard of. And that's when people start like going into like ecstasy. Because they are like, holy, I've been able to get an instrument that is holding its value. I didn't need a bank to do that on my own. I can do whatever I want. And yes, I can go into dollars if I want to, but I cannot and see if this thing keeps going. So that's a big, big distinction. It goes back to kind of what I mentioned earlier about how, well, it's basically product market fit is strongest in places where the financial markets are weakest or most, well, as you can tell from this story you've just gone through, the most manipulated. It doesn't work. Like trade is just broken. Right. So Mauricio, this amazing story leads to becoming the co-founder of Ledin. And I'd love to hear the Genesis story for that and teach us about what your company does. And, and then we'll get through to hopefully some of the mortgage conversation I wanted to have that started all of this. So teach us about why you started Ledin. Sure. I'll start and try not to rant too much. So <laughs> as I mentioned, we started in mining. Okay. That's how I got into Bitcoin. And then slowly we started discovering every other piece of the ecosystem. But that was the first thing. What was what we knew what to do. We knew, we knew how to do it. And we helped a lot of people replicate our model in Venezuela to get ahead. So many people came to us looking for help on how to set up their mines, where to buy the equipment, what electrical upgrades were needed. And we were basically teaching people left, right, and center. That had the benefit of teaching me how to, or me giving me the experience of working with like dozens of miners and setting up like 
hundreds, if not thousands of ASICs and, and GPU rigs uh, for, for people that we were helping as a family. I was working and living in Canada and I knew you couldn't build a business in Venezuela that would be sustainable. Like I, I, I knew that would never happen. So my first inclination was to start mining in Canada because Canada had to have the cheapest power in the free world. So it was a great place to mine. And my best friend for university, Adam, had been financing renewable energy for 10 years. And so he knew where to find cheap power. So I, I went to Adam and we together started a mine in Quebec. I, we, I convinced him to, to start a mine with me in Quebec. And we started trying to grow the mine. And we always kept thinking about what businesses we can do in the space that adds value. And we kept focused on mining. We kept trying to grow the mine, grow the mine. But to grow the mine, the only way to do that was selling the Bitcoin to pay for the equipment. Mm. The equipment had a very long turn, turnaround time, like nine months back then at Bitmain. So you would be paying Bitcoin and losing all of your opportunity. Like Bitcoin would be rallying, but you would be none. You got none of it. Mm. And all we wanted was for someone to lend us dollars backed by the Bitcoin. <laughs> and people laughed us out of the room every time. And the answers, they're engraved in my mind. The one we heard the most was, ha ha ha, Bitcoin's not an asset. <laughs> and by the third or fourth ha ha ha, we kind of looked at each other, Adam and I, and we said, Okay, if we can figure this one out, we're going to help all of the miners that have the same issue as we do. But it won't stop there because Bitcoin is property. Okay, Bitcoin is digital gold, digital real estate. It has better property rights than most assets globally, mm -hmm. perhaps outside of US real estate and Australia real estate or maybe Canadian. Like there's a, a, a handful of countries that have sound markets, both real estate and capital markets. The rest of the world has never seen this. And this is the property that is now the best asset in their portfolio is Bitcoin. So all this to say that anyone that has Bitcoin should get a mortgage on it. Like the same way you have a house in Australia and you're going to get a mortgage on your house and it costs you very little to borrow against the house because it's a great asset. It's very liquid. Bitcoin is the same thing. I see a world where borrowing against your Bitcoin in dollar terms will be cheaper than borrowing against U.S. real estate mm -hmm. because it's a better asset to lend against. Mm -hmm. And basically, that was the genesis of Ledin. We didn't want to sell our Bitcoin to grow or mine. Nobody would give us a Bitcoin back loan. We looked around the options to get a Bitcoin back loan. There was one more group that was doing it back then, and it required tokens. They're, they're no longer, they no longer exist, but it required tokens to get a loan. And we didn't want to have a platform that needed tokens to get a loan. Like we thought that made no sense. You don't get you don't get like TD back tokens to get a loan from TD or you know. And so we wanted a business that was clean and free from all these mm. crypto schemes. Like we just wanted to be a traditional, transparent company that did one thing very well: lend against Bitcoin. And that's how Ledin got to be. That's the genesis of Ledin. And so, how long have you guys been going for now? Uh, five years. We've been running since 2018. We did Canada's first Bitcoin back loan in 2018. And we did the world's first Bitcoin mortgage. <laughs> it was late last year. Fantastic. So let's talk through what the mechanics of that looks like as a, as a deal structure. So a mortgage is probably the most easy for people to understand. As I see the traditional mortgage process, it's like, okay, my name's Jake. I have a salary per annum that is say 100 grand. I look at this house over here, it's worth a million dollars. I want to put a hundred grand down as a deposit and I'm going to get 90% loan from a financier somewhere at a fixed rate for five years. And they're going to look at that and they say, okay, as long as you give us the house, if you don't pay us, then you can have that loan. And that's roughly what a mortgage is. When you are involving Bitcoin in that process, at least the pain point for me is I only want to buy Bitcoin. I actually don't want to own real estate. And contrary to what you mentioned just now about property rights in developed markets like Australia. What happened with the lockdowns, et cetera, scared the shit out of me. I don't want to buy real estate. I want to rent it and I want to buy Bitcoin and I want to take debt against that. But then how does that play into like that mortgage scenario I just painted? So yeah, I'd love to understand a bit more the mechanics of how that actually works. Sure. So let me tell you why the product came to be. So sure. Brilliant. First, a small misdemeanor on what a mortgage is. So a lot of people think that a mortgage is a loan on the house or on the property, like backed by the property, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not. If you show up to a bank today with no income and you want to buy a property, they will laugh at you. They will laugh you out of the room. 
Um, you may have enough money to put a down payment. The house might be worth more than what you're borrowing. As they exist today, it's not a loan on the property. It's a loan on your income backed by the property. If you don't have the income, you will not qualify for any mortgage. So why does this product exist? Bitcoiners, especially those that got Bitcoin very early on, a lot of these guys are entrepreneurs, contract workers, you know, self-entrepreneurs, right? They might be day traders or traders. Um, they don't have employment income, okay? Their income looks very wonky. You know, they, they have deal payouts or they might just live off of the Bitcoin they have or their interest payments of their Bitcoin that is generating yield. You show up to a bank with that and you may have $5 million ready to put down on a $10 million house, but the bank's going to look at you and say, sorry, you don't have the income. The way this product came to be is we had a lot of big Bitcoiners coming to us and said, hey guys, I'm going to buy a house. Okay. The bank has told me that they won't lend me the money to buy the house, but that's because I don't own the house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out a big Bitcoin back loan from you guys, buy the house. And when I own the house, title is mine, I'll go to the bank and then they'll for sure give me the loan and I'll repay whatever I can from this one. And I said, perfect, all power to you. We'll give the loan, a few months come back, the client comes back and says, guys, guess what? They wouldn't even give me the loan now. Even though I own the house, I won't get, I, they're not getting me the loan. And this happened to one, two, three, four, five people. And Though basically all of them in a chorus were basically saying, can you take my house as collateral for the loan so that I can release some of this Bitcoin and potentially buy another house with it? Because I'll need only half of the collateral if you accept my house as collateral and I can buy another house. And we said, well, wait a second. Real estate is a great asset to lend against. It's a much more stable asset than Bitcoin in terms of pricing movements. It's not as volatile. And it, it, it allows us to do or add a few things that we can't normally offer in our standard loans because of the added stability of the collateral. So basically, it allows us to do a couple of things. It allows us to, A, extend the purchasing power of a Bitcoiner when it comes to real estate, because he would now need less Bitcoin to buy a house versus a Bitcoin to do whatever, anything else, because the house can be taken as collateral. So we expand the purchasing power of your Bitcoin when it comes to real estate through the mortgage. The second one is we're able to give you a slightly longer term than we do in our standard Bitcoin back loans. So the mortgage term is two years, where, where our standard term is one year for the Bitcoin back loan. And the other thing that, that we can do is we can give you more time to come up with the additional collateral and Bitcoin terms in the event that the price of Bitcoin drops. Because we have the house as collateral. In our standard loans, all of that is programmatic because when Bitcoin hits a certain threshold, the loan has to be closed to avoid it going under from what we lent. And that's in place to protect the business and, and our clients on the USDC side. Everybody, really, that's in place to protect the integrity of the whole operation. On the mortgage side, if the price drops, because the price of the real estate collateral is a lot more stable and it's not moving in the same sort of the velocity of mag magnitude, it allows us to give you more flexibility when it comes to topping up your collateral. So combined, all of those three things make a pretty compelling product. So people were very excited about when it came out. It's still very exciting today. Of course, lots has happened since then. You know, real estate markets are kind of calmed down a bit because of how high the Fed rates have gone. And Bitcoin prices come down quite a bit from when we announced the product. So People can't really purchase the same big houses that they could have perhaps at the top of 2021. But to us, when the market comes back and Bitcoiners want to effectively convert some of that Bitcoin into hard assets that they can live in, the product's going to be right there. Yeah, it's awesome. What I quite like as well is thinking through that the customer at this point is very niche. There's not that many people that own a lot of Bitcoin that want to get some kind of liquidity against it. But if Bitcoin does what we expect it to do, that market only gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time. So that's very cool as a kind of entrepreneurial opportunity. What I'd love to th do, though, is just understand from a risk perspective, how should people think of this from a risk perspective as a potential customer? There's two risks in, in the Bitcoin mortgage product. The first one is, of course, volatility risk. So there's a risk that 
you don't plan accordingly and you do not allow yourself for a collateral cushion in Bitcoin in case the price of Bitcoin drops significantly and you don't allow yourself enough planning or added extra capacity to top up that loan to bring it back to a healthy condition. Okay, so because Bitcoin is part of the collateral, as is the house, if Bitcoin price drops by basically more than 50% from the time you took out the loan, you will have to top up Bitcoin collateral so that the loan goes back to healthy position and we avoid having to close the loan. So the main thing here is to plan accordingly so that you have enough Bitcoin to account for a price move and allow you to bring that loan back to a healthy condition. So that would be the one I like to stress very much to clients so that they can plan and respond accordingly. Like we don't want people to be overextended on any one product because it leads to complicated situations if the market goes in the opposite direction. So we want people to always plan accordingly and understand that there is a risk that Bitcoin price could drop and that you may be required to send more Bitcoin. So that's number one. The second one is, you know, the sort of broader counterparty risk to let in, right? Like if something nuclear happened, Lenin went out of business for whatever reason, you know, there would be a process for the person to go through to sort of get free and clear of the lien. So, you know, there would be a loan outstanding to let in and let in would have a lien on the, both the Bitcoin and the property. So there would be a process basically to resolve that. Um, those would be the two main risks to this product. And we are, you know, I believe one of, if not the only remaining Bitcoin lender. And so I'm incredibly proud of how our team has navigated the latest market episodes. I, I think we've come out of it in much stronger. We've learned a ton and, you know, we're using all of the learnings to make the business safer. And so I'm incredibly excited about the prospects, but those would be the two big buckets of risks. Awesome. Thank you for highlighting that. It, it must have been an incredible kind of Let's just call it a 12 months. I personally had some funds with Celsius, not a large percentage by any means of my personal portfolio, but playing around with USDC and Ethereum and some of their yield products. And it was, it was very, very easy to use, which was cool. But you know, ultimately, it went bankrupt and I can't get my money out. And they said, you can't take your funds. And the idea of the kind of the scaled up and scaled down loans you could take out. So you could kind of ratchet up and down. It was kind of interesting. But as you said, it was all programmable. So there wasn't really much of a window to to kind of recapitalize any potential debt position you might take. So it's a very interesting concept, having the house in there as an asset that's more stable in dollar terms. And therefore, you're not able to, or you're, you have a, a bigger window to allow customers to send you extra Bitcoin. I mean, that's really crucial because, you know, you live in a house, your family's there. If suddenly the market moves 50%, which does happen, and you're like, oh, I don't have a house any longer. Like, that's a big, big problem, right? So that's cool to hear that you've, you've tackled that. Well done. No, I appreciate it. And that, that actually, we, we've tried to tackle that too for our standard Bitcoin back loan product. So we understand that this market can move and it usually moves at inopportune times, <laughs> like when you're sleeping or things like this. So we have created this feature at Lenin called Auto Top Up. And what Auto Top Up does is you, if you have money in your savings account and you have an open loan with Lenin, you can pre-authorize the platform to send Bitcoin from your savings account to your loan collateral in real time when it meets it to the amount you specify and to the loan you specify. And what this does is it ensures that even if the move happens when you're not ready to make the transaction, you have already pre-authorized that transaction. Our platform will move it in real time and you won't have to wake up and do the transaction yourself. So that's one of the features that we've implemented. There's a lot more things that we do at Lenin that are, I think, unique to us, but that's something we care about a lot. We want people to walk out of Lenin with more Bitcoin than when they brought mm -hmm. in. <laughs> I think you've already highlighted, Mauricio, that the, the crucial difference is that you, you came from a very Bitcoin background in terms of that mining. You had a very specific use case and were very clear about, we just want to work in dollars and Bitcoin. The, the companies that got wrapped up in all the other different, you know, altcoins, et cetera, that's where the, the, the major risk came from in the last kind of downturn, shall we say, and the fraud, right? People just printing their own money, pocketing your Bitcoin. And it's just crazy what was going on. You mentioned you've learned a lot as a team. I'm intrigued. What do you think is probably the main learning as entrepreneurs trying to, to figure out this debt and Bitcoin space over the last kind of six or 12 months? I think the biggest learning to me is eventually the universe tends to unfold as it should, you know, is, is what they say. So, for example, 
during the run-up, we had companies in the lending industry, I won't name names, but some of the companies were saying that their deposits were FDIC insured. And we are in this industry, we know that cannot be true. <laughs> and so we knew that these people were misrepresenting the information. And to the people that came to us and brought up the point and made the question saying, hey, these guys are FDIC insured. Are you guys FDIC insured? We would say, no, we cannot be. I would encourage you to heavily question what you're being told here because based on what I know today, it is in, in, incompatible to have any type of these accounts insured by the FDIC. The other thing was sticking to your guns is another big lesson. For example, when the run-up was happening, when Summer of DeFi was happening, we would get phone calls every day being like, hey, when Doge? Or hey, when Shiba? Or hey, when this? And some of our competitors, who you named, were throwing as many things to the wall as they could to get the growth and assets on platform. But the reality was that these were horror products. There was no benefit for a client long-term holding Shiba Inu. Like, why would I want a client to do that at Ledin? I would never want a client to do that at Ledin. You know that's going to be a train wreck. Like, Gemini launched a Doge savings account at the SNL episode that Elon Musk did, like literally like a week before wow. or after. And the chart just does this. So like, how is the client going to end up that used the product? Unhappy. We stay true to our guns. When people were adding Dogecoin and Shiba Inu, we were doing proof of reserves attestations. <laughs> you know, and, and that's why when everybody wanted the proof of reserves attestations, three years later, hey, guess what? We've done five of them. Come check out our latest one. Mm. But everybody was running backwards, trying to like backwards compatible all these proof of reserves reports. Do you know what's hard? To do a proof of reserves in a company that has 200 assets and 200 services. Mm. I would argue almost physically impossible. <laughs> it's not. Theoretically, everything's possible. But when you're trying to track where 200 assets across yeah. two dozen products, across how many million clients, across how many million DeFi protocols or hundreds of DeFi protocols and counterparties, at Ledin, we didn't want the business to have to retroactively feed transparency to it. We wanted to put all the pipes of transparency as early on as we could, because when you build things on top of a transparent foundation, the whole building can be transparent. But when you're trying to make transparency, after you build the whole thing with concrete, you're trying to make it transparent. You're going to have to like bust walls. It's not going to be pretty. So it's just design considerations. And we were called, I still remember this, you know, we were called the boring Canadians. Because everybody else was running fast and adding these tokens and paying 12% when we were paying eight. And I had clients saying, I'm moving to Celsius, they're paying 12. You know, why can't you pay 12? And I was like, we lend a 10. You can see it in our Bitcoin back loan rates. Like, I cannot afford to pay you 12. I would have to go to way far out the risk spectrum. I don't want to go there. I don't know how they're getting to 12. I can tell you how I'm getting my seven. I asked them to tell you how they're getting to 12. But most people didn't do that. They just stopped at, oh, I'm just going to go for the 12. Little do they know that our seven is back two to one by Bitcoin and never had a loan loss, <laughs> still hasn't had a loan loss or retail Bitcoin back loan book, whereas the Celsius 12 on stables was happening on Terra, which collapsed. And so, you know, if we had listened, we probably would have said, oh, damn, how do we get this 12? Let's try to figure out how to get the 12 and go to Terra. We never did that. It was never even an internal discussion. Like we just said, we're going to do what we're here to do. We will run a race and people will wake up to these things later on, eventually. And I'm happy that a lot of our theses are being validated. I wish so many people didn't have to lose money in the process. Mm. But we feel that our conviction is even stronger today than it was a year ago. I mean, it's tuition fees, ultimately. Like People figure it out. But it's extraordinary to think that there were companies out there that were actually misrepresenting as blatantly as saying we're FDIC insured when it was impossible to be. I mean, that's just blatant scam. But when someone says, look, trust us, we've got government approval and they've got such a slick marketing process, it's very easy to see how people get lured in. Well, Mauricio, thank you so much for telling your story today. It's been another excellent, excellent journey as to why Bitcoin's an important thing to take notice of. And then equally, the entrepreneurship that's happening on top is exciting as well. Final question is just where can people reach out to get in touch if they have any questions? Yeah, I'm on Twitter a lot. My handle is at Cryptonomist with an A at the end, Cryptonomista. 
And Latin is at Huddle with Latin. And uh, I.io is our official website. I write the weekly newsletter at Latin. It's a blog.latin.io. It's called the Bitcoin Economic Calendar. Every week we put out the calendar of events that could affect Bitcoin that week, like Fed decisions, options expirations, earnings from companies like MicroStrategy, Coinbase, et cetera. And uh, we do a deep dive into macro themes or digital asset specific themes that are driving price action. And so you can check it out, blog.latin.io. Awesome. Well, Mauricio, thanks so much for joining today. Thanks, Jake. Okay, friends, nice work. You made it all the way to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this conversation. If you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to reach out. And if you enjoyed the episode, then please rate, like, subscribe, and share. That's it for now. Enjoy the rest of your day. All the best, Jake.